what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. something over even something so useful 
as bustling around to make guests feel welcome in the home. And if truth be told, most of us, for most of us, this passage we would use as justification for not getting involved in the life and ministry of the church. It is even possible, and this is what we do often with these texts, which one are you? I did that last week sort of thing with, you know, are you the Levite, are you the priest, are you the Samaritan, and, uh, and we forget about the poor old victim, just like the Levite and the priest. It is possible for us to set up the two sisters, Martha and Mary, as examples of different vocations, equal in importance, equal in value. We can do that. Mary, the contemplative one, lucky one that she is, can devote herself and her time to prayer and to various spiritual practices. Martha, on the other hand, seems like the rest of us who struggle with the demands of life in the world, praying on the run if we pray at all, and getting on with the inconvenience of the various ministries we might be involved in because there's no one else willing to step up to the plate. Dear friends, cemeteries are full of indispensable people. The distinction between Mary and Martha, contemplation and action, prayer and service, comes across as a very tidy and neat little package of distinction. And for that reason, and that reason alone, it should be treated as highly suspect. Life is seldom neat, and issues of faith are hardly ever simple. No. Like all our encounters and conversations with Jesus in the Gospels, something more is involved. There's something deeper than just the superficial. The story of Jesus as a guest in the home of Mary and Martha does not justify dividing ourselves as Christians into basically two classes. Spiritual aristocrats, you know, the super-Christians, and the rest of us. Instead, what this passage does, it challenges all of us. And it does, and it challenges us in a way that doesn't need to separate us from each other. You know, the super-Christians and the not so super christians What makes Mary of Bethany an example is not that she sits at the Master's feet, no. What makes her sister Martha need, um, makes her sister Martha need, for example, is not that she labors intensely to accommodate others. What is at stake here lies elsewhere. And let's call that elsewhere passionate spirituality. Passionate spirituality takes a lot of different forms. It doesn't have to be emotional rather than reasonable. It doesn't have to be extroverted rather than introverted. And it doesn't have to be contemporary rather than traditional. What makes someone's spirituality passionate is three things. Oh dear, now you have to remember five words. Prayer, enthusiasm, and courage. People of passionate spirituality live very committed lives. They practice their faith with joy. They practice their faith with a lot of enthusiasm. 
passionate spirituality can spill out either through service or study or devotion. It can be apparent in absolutely everything that we do in our lives. Dear friends, the problem with Martha is not her hospitality. It is how she doesn't let her hospitality become a channel for a, spiritually a, a spirituality marked by passion. Instead, she becomes distracted. She even complains to Jesus about her sister rather than speaking to her sister directly. You know, it's like, sometimes you're just like little children. Ma, James won't let me play with that thing. Instead of going to James and saying, James, can I please play? It appears that Martha is driven by duty. She is driven by duty instead of, and three weeks ago we sang that song, Joy, 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 with joy my heart is ringing. She's not driven by joy, she's driven by rut, by duty. I have to do this. Not because I want to, but because I have to. Martha may well be an effective organizer. She may be a great cook. She may be conscientious in everything that she does. But she is simply reasonable. She's not inspired. Even on the day when Jesus himself comes for dinner, inspiration doesn't get her. She may even be busy and anxious in I guess an effort to perhaps avoid listening to what Jesus has to say. What makes Mary an example is not the simple fact that she sits down at Jesus' feet and listens, but that she does so in a way that is both passionate and courageous. Jesus doesn't so much commend her behavior as the spirit that motivates that behavior. Mary chooses to take some risks. That's the courageous part. She takes the chance, firstly, of upsetting her sister. Mary's not helping. She's just listening. She just sits there. That's what Martha sounds like. Mary also takes a risk in upsetting plenty of other people because what she does is she takes the role of a disciple sitting at the feet of her rabbi. So many of you remember the movie Yentl, Barbara Streisand. Okay, I pulled out the music book with Barbara Streisand music in it last night. This will make me think about it. That's the story. You see, what Mary did was a serious taboo. It is not something that good Jewish woman in her society did. It was a role of the learning role was reserved for men only. Thank goodness we've changed. Still that's where Mary places herself, or rather, where perhaps the Spirit leads Mary. So some of you may say, I buy into what you call passionate spirituality. Of course I do. I recognize that it is the way to go for all Christian people. And what's more, I recognize that passionate spirituality does not have to be either emotional or reasonable. I recognize it doesn't have to be extroverted or introverted. I even recognize it con that it doesn't have to be contemporary or traditional. But tell me, how does a 
compassionate spirituality come about. Dear friends, you understood everything I said right. Passionate spirituality is more God's gift than it is anything that we do. It's more for us to welcome that gift than somehow to achieve that gift. And passionate spirituality results from a series of life conversions. Each of us, dear friends, is called repeatedly. We're invited to turn away from something and towards something else. The conversions that occur in our lives may cause us to turn towards God, to turn toward Christ, toward the church, toward the poor and marginalized, toward a better life of prayer, towards certain forms of service within our community, say, like the music fellowship, or the lay ministry, or service, or council. But what they do is they, toward, they, they, these conversions turn the world towards the God that loves it. These conversions, and really I can go on all day about different types of conversions and how perhaps Benedict of um, Monte Cassino described conversion. All of these conversions happen to us in all sorts of different ways. And they can happen in any order. And any of them can occur in our lives more than once. Each of us, dear friends, is invited many times through our lives to turn in a new direction. Passionate spirituality happens again and again when we respond to these calls. And we enter into new dimensions of the great gift of life. We cannot make these calls happen. But we can leave ourselves, our hearts, our minds, our very lives open so that we can hear those calls when they happen. Spiritual practices and forms of service properly understood are to a large degree forms or ways of listening to God, listening to our Lord Jesus. In this way, prayer, scripture, receiving communion, helping those in need and somehow finding a way to be involved in parish life, maybe going on a retreat, all these practices and so many others are ways for us, like Mary, to sit at Jesus' feet as a disciple and hear what he has to say to us. It was risky for Mary to sit as a disciple at the feet of Jesus in a culture that did not leave room for her and other women to do such things. We ourselves, and this is where courage comes in, we ourselves may find it risky for all sorts of reasons, some of them self-imposed, to undertake spiritual practices in a receptive way, to answer the call to continuing conversion, to becoming, um, let's use the word from growing the church, continuing to become ablaze, on fire with passionate spirituality or what Jesus calls the one thing necessary. We may after all find ourselves taken to unexpected places like poor old Peter at the end when you were young some, you dressed yourself you went where you wanted to go but when you're older someone else will dress you, someone else will gird you and lead you where you do not wish to go. And I think this is where 
um, Bishop Allen's, last week we put in the pew leaflet the thing that he wrote for the clergy, and this week is the letter that he sends to everybody, some kind of uh, our bishops I'd loves. And it is expected of me to read it for you. Um, I'll try and, I'll leave the reading out, that's why I got Jan to read it. Bishop Allen writes, and he wrote on the 14th of July, Dear people of God, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, please accept my sincere and profound gratitude for raising me to this weighty vocation. I am deeply humbled and more than overwhelmed at the trust invested in me. I ask for your prayers, which I need to ensure that I will be worthy of the call with, with which I have been called. The words of St. Augustine of Hippo have helped me to overcome a little of the trepidation which I experienced after the elective assembly and the service of consecration. Believe me, brothers and sisters, if what I am for you frightens me, what I am with you reassures me. For you, I am the bishop. With you, I am a Christian. I take comfort from knowing that I am not alone. I am surrounded by God-loving people, and together we are Christians, and we shall give our best to God. And then he quotes from the Acts of the Apostles, which read, uh, Young read for us. And this is the second thing he refers to. I have come to discern this description of the early church, as in Acts, as a driving force for my Episcopal leadership amongst you. Words and phrases like the Apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of the bread, prayer, together, and everything in common will be the foundation and mission priorities of my Episcopacy. The essential elements of the religious practice of the early church came into being as described in this Acts passage because of the early church's acceptance and rootedness in Jesus. Here we find an illustration of what happens when God's people are blessed with an endowment of the Holy Spirit to equip them for the service of God. I commit to seek, work, and pray for no less in obedience to Christ and to my vocation. Thirdly, the first 50 days of my Episcopal ministry have been an absolute roller coaster ride, but amongst the many firsts were two very sad occasions which deeply affected our common life. At the beginning of June, we stood over the open graves of both. Reverend Swele Kude Sondiazi and his wife Tsalani. They tragically died of natural causes within three days of each other. Then, in the middle of June, we joined the Olson family to bury Billy, husband to Reverend Canon Patricia Olson. Your continued prayers are asked for, um, are asked for the Sondiazi and Olson families and for Reverend Joan Jones, who is a deacon at Waterkloof, who lost her husband in February this year. Lastly, a word and a prayer for the upcoming local elections on August 3rd this year. I urge all to cast their votes on the 3rd of August to elect local leaders who will have the courage to speak out against the entitlement and patronage part of politics that has come to define our political landscape. The pre-election violence which resulted in the sad death of five people and the mindless destruction of property in Sony recently brought into sharp focus the bickering prevalent even amongst members of the same political alliance. This is most worrying. It adds to the downward spiral that characterizes our common life. Our Democratic dispensation has been hard won. Many have paid with their lives for us to enjoy the full democratic privilege for all citizens, 
to put our own leaders in place. The ideals and gains of their sacrifice have all but been realized. The elections present us with an opportunity to say, not in our name. Pope Francis recently said that we need more politicians who are genuinely disturbed by the state of society, the people, the lives of the poor. Political parties and individuals who show that they are genuinely disturbed by the high unemployment rate, corruption, the slow pace of service delivery, substance abuse, the rising cost of living, the high levels of crime, amongst others, should enjoy our support. I am working with the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, the Methodist Church and others to forge relationships which would help us to respond jointly to events in our city that need a word from our church leaders. We are planning an open air prayer meeting at Church Square during lunch hour on the 20th of July, that's Wednesday. There's another insert for you. Details about this are communicated in a separate communication. In addition, here is a prayer that you may want to use in the assemblies of the church or in your private devotions. So let us pray that prayer together. Gracious God, you change times and seasons, depose kings and set up kings. We acknowledge you as the Lord, not only of individuals, but of nations and governments. We thank you for the privilege of being able to participate in our local elections. We thank you for the opportunity that this election puts before us. Grant us the wisdom to discern how we should vote, so that we may be blessed with leaders who are genuinely concerned by our social ills, and who would want to commit to work for the common good of all, and especially the poor and marginalized. Grant us peaceful elections, through Jesus Christ, who has revealed the kingdom to us, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who reigns with you, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And his final salutation now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. God bless you all. And it's signed, Bishop Alan Pretoria. Dear friends, each of the things that we spoke about and that we looked at today and countless other things was taken to, has been taken to some unexpected place due to embracing that one thing necessary and it is called passionate spirituality. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as we affirm our faith in God as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed, page 108.